Do you treat Biden's rhetoric with the same level of seriousness that you treat Trump's rhetoric? Or I should probably put that the other way around. Should we treat Trump's rhetoric with the same level of seriousness as Joe Biden or, say, Barack Obama's rhetoric? Um, I'm going to try to be concise when I say this. Broadly speaking, especially instead of Israel, Palestine, and Ukraine, Russia, I try not to... How you doing, everybody? Simple Sun back again. Um, hopefully, uh, you watched part one. If you don't, go back and check that out. It's the first 30 minutes or so of this debate uh, with me interjecting on some of the ideas that they were spewing out and um, nonsensical stuff, you know, uh, big platter of platitudes. And uh, this is the continuation. Uh, but again, go back and check that video out. Um uh, so we can catch up together. And uh, we're going to get into this and see where this heads. What platitudes they got to say this time. My local community, we all vote. Again, I've, I've suggested that there's a difference between local community and federal. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with my local community voting for school lunches or air conditioning or whatever it is that we all agree to do. Because the more local you get, the more homogeneity you get in terms of interest and the more interest you have in your neighbors. All of that's fine. I'm part of a very, very solid community in our community we give to each other we have minimum standards of helping one another all that's wonderful when it comes to the actual problem of education mm -hmm. what i object to in the political sphere and this happens all the time is everybody is arguing on top of the iceberg about how we can move the needle 0.5 percentage points as opposed to the entire iceberg melting beneath them. And we just ignore that. And we pretend that that's just, you know, sort of the natural consequence of thing. The arc of history suggests that people are never going to get married again. They, well, I mean, actually what the arc of history suggests, realistically speaking, is that the people who are not getting married are not going to be having kids. And what it also suggests, the people who are married are going to be having kids. And so the demographic profile actually over time is rather going to shift toward people who are having lots and lots of kids. I'm married. I have four kids. Everyone in my community is married. It's like minimum buy-in in my community is four kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the problem with this is, again, women date hypergamy. There's a you know a certain percentage of men who are actually going to replicate their cells, aka having children. So, it, you know, at least in some realm, it's it's survival of the fittest, right? You know, fifteen to twenty percent of men are basically going to replicate themselves, where the other eighty percent are just genetic dead ends, right? Um, th this is going to happen a lot. I mean, most of the time, women weren't genetic dead ends, for the most part. There was a always a lot of male genetic dead ends, you know, when it came to society. But we're going to find out, you know, very soon how not uh, fixing the birth rate is going to come back and bite us in the ass. Okay, and so what's happening, actually, in terms of demographics, is that the people who are more religious and getting married are having more kids. And so if you're talking about the arc of history shifting toward marriage, I, I would suggest that actually demographically over time, long periods of time, not over one generation, over long periods of time, the only cure for low birth rate is going to be the people who get married and have lots of kids. That's true, unless there's some weird government program that's going to incentivize women to the point of just pumping out multiple children, which I don't advocate for. But I do advocate for, for marriage, you know, actually more uh, religious church base. Uh, Christian-based values marriage would be preferable. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with any of that, but I'm just saying that, again, on the, I know you're upset when I bring up the term merry-go-round, um, I think that there are good conversations to be had about people getting married um, because stable families produce stable children that are less likely to commit crime, that are more likely to go to school, that are more likely to be productive members of society, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to disagree with you on any of that. All right. of that is true. Um, it's just frustrating that sometimes when you bring up any problem, all of it will circle back to other things that makes it seem like we can't make any progress in any area without like fixing something. Well, I mean well, that's just because you don't like the solution, right? Again, you don't like the solution because the solution... Uh, is is totally juxtaposed to what your lifestyle is right like you have a more debaucherous uh you know uh sexy sexy free time lifestyle to you you know what i mean you have an open relationship or had or i don't know I, really i don't know what your relationship is i don't like really even like speaking on other people's relationships but it's certainly not you know preferable for you know a society to do this on mass because if everybody did that we'd be in a lot more trouble than we are right now i mean I, I literally just told you that on the local level i'm fine for people voting for air yeah but so for instance on the local level so for school funding school funding is done i think generally per district yeah but school funding never worked there's been funding and funding and more funding for years for, for decades 
you took money away, you you put money in, it didn't matter. You know, our kids got dumber over time. It's cultural, it's societal. It's, uh, it starts at the home. So what do you do when you have poor districts that can't afford air conditioning for their schools? I mean, the idea there would be that presumably if the society, meaning the state, mm-hmm. and I generally don't mean the federal state. I mean, like, Why does it feel like that Destiny is just using a red herring of like air conditioning and sandwiches that actually justify why kids are dumb? It's a red herring. I mean, oh, oh, there's kids dumb because there's there's not enough air conditioning. Uh, there was plenty of years. What? How long have we had like at least some kind of schooling in the United States of America? The vast majority of years never had air conditioning. Just didn't. Like the state of California, for example, mm-hmm. decides that everybody ought to have air conditioning. People will vote for air conditioning, and that's perfectly legal. And I don't think there's anything morally objectionable about okay. that per okay. se. Cool. I also don't think that that's going to heal anything remotely like the central problem. Sure. And I think I that what, what, what tends to happen in terms of government is... Do you agree? You're saying, yeah, I agree. I agree. Then why are you bringing it up? It's a red herring. You're, you're creating a straw man argument of your own making. You, you, you started this argument, and then you're still continuing to straw man yourself. People love arguing about the problems that can be solved by opening a wallet, and nobody likes to solve a problem by, you know, closing... Fixing the culture. Fixing society itself. Their sex life to one person, for example. Mm -hmm. Or having kids within a stable religious community. Like, the things that actually build society... I'm fine with arguing about each of these policies. And and whether we apply them or not is a matter generally of pragmatism. Not morality. It's a matter of incentive structures, not per se morality. Mm -hmm. Because incentive structures do have moral underpinnings. There's such a thing as, for example, if you're going to use a welfare program, you have to decide how effective it is to what crowd it applies, where the cutoffs are. Does it disincentivize work? Does it not? All of these are pragmatic concerns. Mm -hmm. But on a moral level, the generalized objection that I have to people on the left side of the aisle is that they like to focus in these conversations, very often it feels as though it's a conversation with, with people who are drunk searching under the, the lamp for their keys. The problems they want to look at are the problems that are solvable by government. Mm-hmm. And then all the problems they don't want to look at, which are the actual giant monsters lurking in the dark and not particularly solvable by government, are the ones they want to ignore and assume are just the natural state of things. And I don't think yeah. that's correct at all. And I 1 billion percent agree. And then obviously my credit. Well, you can't. You've, you've said this so many times. I agree. I agree. I 1 billion percent agree. Well, you don't because you're about to rebuttal that with the same goddamn argument of uh, what about the air conditioner, though, right? You know, that, that ancient, you know, martial arts. What about the AC, though? Watch. Criticism for the conservative side is the exact opposite, where where there are parts where government could remedy some issues. Um, for instance, you know, uh, children having sex with each other and producing other children out of wedlock. Like sometimes having after school programs is. What about the AC though? It's nice to prevent that. Like I didn't have time for these things when I was in school. I was doing football practice. I was doing cross country practice. I went in early for a band. You know, um, I agree with you that sometimes people only focus on one end of the problem. As a, I hate to be that guy, um, but as somebody that have you ever watched The Wire? Sure. I'm not going to cite the wires real life example, but like obviously, there's only so much you can do in a school when the children coming in are so beyond destroyed because of the family life and everything prior to them even getting to school that day. So I agree. Well, that that goes with with Ben's argument again. It starts there, right? Like that's the issue, right? You could have all the air conditioning in the world and all the, the yummy sandwiches that you could possibly imagine, but that's never going to change how stupid those kids are. They don't even want to learn. Agree. Government is not like the solution to broken families. That would never be the case. And it's actually and not the solution to education, depending on the kind of solutions that you're talking about. Some solutions, yes. Some mm-hmm. solutions, no. Yeah. So the only thing I'm looking at is, as I said earlier, just like these minimum threshold things where it's like, where can government make? Because you mentioned marginal, which I think is a really good way to look at things. There are marginal costs and marginal utility to things where the first thousand dollars per student you spend might give you a huge return, but the extra 20,000 after is yeah, just I think these are all pragmatic more. discussions. Sure, of and course. Okay. Actually, this is what we used to hash out in legislatures before they turned into platforms for people grandstanding, but yes. Sure. Okay, yeah. As we descend from the heavens of philosophical discussion of conservatism and liberalism, let's go to the pragmatic muck of politics. Trump versus Biden. Between the two of them, who was in their first term uh, the better president? And thus, who should win 
if the two of them are, in fact, our choices, should win a second term in 2024. How much you want to bet that Ben Shapiro, one of the sentences says out of his mouth is, I'm not really a fan of Donald Trump. Ben? Sure. So, in terms of actual job performance, you have to separate it into a few categories. Uh, in terms of actual performance in foreign policy, I think Trump's foreign policy record is significantly better than Biden's, the world being on fire right now, being a fairly good example of that. Uh, and we can get into each aspect of the world being on fire and where the incentive structures came from and how all of that happened in a moment. When it comes to the economy, I think that Trump's economic record was better than Biden's. Doesn't mean he didn't overspend. He did. He wildly overspent. Uh, but he also had a very solid record of job creation. A huge percentage of the gains in the economy went to people on the lower end of the economic spectrum. Actually, uh, the gross income to the average American was about $6,000 during his term. The unemployment rates were very, very low before COVID. You know, it, I think that you almost have to separate the Trump administration into sort of before COVID and during COVID, because COVID obviously is a sort of a black swan event, the, the most signal change in, in politics in our lifetime. Uh, and so, you know, governance during COVID is almost its own category, which we can discuss. Um, but, you know, in terms of foreign policy, in terms of domestic policy, I think that Trump was significantly better. Uh, well, beyond that, beyond that, uh, regardless if you like Donald Trump or not, because, I, I mean, it's neither here or there. It's it, I'm more of the, 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 the policy match with culture, right? Cultural aspect with mixed with religion, right? So I'm not so much of, like, a super fan of Donald Trump. But I do agree that he was better than uh, Joe Biden, right? Uh, but to the point of Ben, he, he, you know, his last argument was like, well, it, you know, it's about culture, it's about family life, it's about this, it's about that, it's about these metaphorical things, these metaphysical, physical things that we can't really, like, put a finger on or put a dollar amount on. Um, I, I think basically that was Donald Trump's, you know, silver bullet for things because he, he did kind of put, like, you know, the stake in the heart of uh, a, a lot of cultural issues, little wokeisms and, you know, stuff like that. You know, I, I think that's where, where Ben's missing because, I mean, he's staying with the numbers, great. and But, but Destiny is going to have a, you know, he's going to have uh, his juxtaposition for numbers, right? Because, again, COVID skewed everything. Uh, than, than Biden has been. And that's on the upside for Trump. On the downside for Biden, obviously, you're talking 40-year highs in inflation. You're talking about savings being eaten away. You're talking about everything being 20 to 30 percent more expensive. Uh, you're talking about massive increases to the deficit, even at a rate that was unknown under Trump. Uh, the deficit under Trump raised by about a little under a trillion dollars every year up until 2020. Again, 2020 was COVID year. So everybody decided that we we're going to fire hose money at things. Um, but uh, then Joe Biden continued to fire hose money at things in 21, 22 and 23. Uh, you know, that obviously is, uh, in my opinion, bad economic policy. Uh, and then you get to the rhetoric and you get to the stuff that Donald Trump says. And as I've said before, my view is that on Donald Trump's epitaph, on his gravestone, it will say Donald Trump. He's had a lot of shit. Uh, I, I think that Donald Trump does say a lot of things. I think that that is basically baked into the cake, which is why everyone who's bewildered by the polls is ignoring human nature, which is at the beginning, when you see something very shocking, it's very shocking. And then if you see it over and over and over and over for years on end, it is no longer shocking. It is just part of the background noise like tinnitus. It just becomes, you know, something that your brain adjusts for. Uh, and so do I like a lot of Donald Trump's rhetoric? No, and I never have. Do I think that that is dispositive as to his presidency? No, I do not. Uh, when it comes to Biden, again, I think he's underperforming economically. I think that his foreign policy has been really a, a, a problem. Even the things I think he's done right are, I think, band-aids for things that he created by doing wrong. Uh, and when it comes to his, his own rhetoric, you can argue that it's grading on a curve because Trump was coming in with such wild rhetoric that just a maintenance of that wild rhetoric doesn't really change again the baseline. For again, you know, what about Trump, though, right? He's He's got his own little martial arts thing because it's like, oh, well, you know, Donald Trump said this and I said that. Um, yeah, but to, e to equalize that with actual actions is, is, is disingenuous. Biden, he came in in the same way that Obama did on the sort of soaring rhetoric of American unity. I'm the president for all. Like Trump came in, he's like, listen, I'm the president for, for what I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to say the things I want to say. I'm beyond the toilet. And I'm tweeting. And we're like, OK, you know, so that's what it is. With Biden, he came in with I'm a president for all Americans. I'm trying to unify everybody. And that pretty quickly broke down into a lot of oppositional language about his political opponents in particular, an attempt to lump in, for example, 
huge swaths of the conservative movement with the people who participated, for example, in January 6th or who were fans of January 6th. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the sort of lumping in of everybody into MAGA Republicans who wasn't personally signed on to a, an infrastructure bill with him. Uh, that, that sort of stuff, I think, has been truly terrible. I thought his Philadelphia speech was truly terrible. And again, I think that you do have the problem of he is no longer capable of certainly rhetorically unifying the country when every speech from him feels like watching Nick Melinda walk across a volcano on a tightrope. It- well, that's because he's a bright dead moron, right? Because, I mean, he's he's he is borderline dementia. He's demented. I mean, uh, I, I've done a couple of videos on, you know, he, he was talking to a barrel or... Um, Saying oh, we could stand with women down Trump, blah, blah 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 blah. I mean, literally sound like that. So, I mean, that's an understatement to say. Well, he just can't rhetorically hold up anymore. He can't physically hold up or mentally hold up anymore either. It it really is like you're you're just sort of waiting for him to fall. <laughs> I mean, it's it's sad to say. I mean, the other day he was speaking for what was in effect his campaign kickoff, and this is in Valley Forge, uh, and. I mean, Jill rushed up there, like, off the, off the, as soon as he was done, Jill rushed up there, uh, you know, like, she'd been shot out of a cannon to, to come and try and guide him away so he didn't become the Shane Gillis Roomba. And, you know, that, that's not really, you know, I, I, let's put it this way. It, it, it does not quiet the soul to watch Joe Biden rhetorically. Again, it's a different problem than, than Trump's problem. But th- that's my analysis. Oh, I think it's a worse problem. It's not even, like, even in the same realm of uh, possibilities. It's, it's, it's totally you know, left field. I mean, say what you want about Donald Trump. Uh, for the most part, he was mentally there, right? Like, you could mentally have a conversation with him and, and it and it made sense, right? Regardless of whether you liked him or not, uh, you could have a conversation with him. Joe Biden, I mean, this guy will sneak off and, like, you know, I mean, I've seen him at a school, like, getting creepy behind, like, this young girl and trying to, like, have a conversation with her. She's like, ah, yeah. Like, please don't stick your nose in my hair. <laughs> so it, it's 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 not even near the same uh, thing. You know what I mean? Uh, this is one of the areas where we get into this. I don't understand um, if there's like brain breaking happening or what's going on. I don't know what world we can ever live in where we say that Trump is less divisive for the country than Biden. I think it is so patently obvious. Trump is so divisive. Like, not only... Well, I got to be honest with you. I didn't see. Uh, I didn't hear Ben say divisive. He didn't use the word divisive once. I don't think. Only does Trump make an enemy out of every person in the opposition party. He makes an enemy out of his own party and every single person around him. Like we all watched him bully, uh, you know, Jeff Sessions. We all watched him bully his own party on Twitter. We all watched like all of these people walk away from him. Um, even recently, I think. Um, his uh, the Secretary of Defense Esper and um, John Kelly, the Chief of Staff, were you know saying I think Trump is a threat to democracy. Um, you know you've got all of his prior people that were around him, some of his closest allies. You've got Bill Barr that won't co-sign a single thing that he says. Um, you've got all these people that he used to work with that all say Trump is a horrible, evil person. He is. Y- yeah, but I mean I gotta stop right there because uh, you know he's saying he's bringing up all these people, all these people are the wishy-washy, you know, plague of Washington, D.C. in the first place, right? So, I mean, that's like saying, you know, that's like picking out, you know, all the underlings of, of Hitler and, and the Third Reich and saying, well, they're this, they're this. Well, yeah, they're trash. We, uh, I mean, you're, you're using trashy, you know, human beings to, you, you know, justify calling Donald Trump a trashy human being, right? Like, well, these people said that... I don't care what these people said or didn't say. They're they're trash too, right? Like, I mean, you can't use... You can't use a uh, Goebel as a as a argument to justify how much you hate Hitler, right? Like, well, well he, Goebel did, said this, right? Like, it just doesn't work that way. So Destiny's a, you know, he's this disingenuous in what he's saying. He's ineffective as a leader. He doesn't accomplish anything, and he didn't. You know, to say that Biden has failed at bipartisanship when, you know, we've gotten the CHIPS Act, we've gotten the IRA, we've gotten the uh, ARP, we've gotten the bipartisan infrastructure bill, when we've gotten, like, all this major legislation that is working in this historically divided Congress, as opposed to Trump that got us tax cuts and deficit spending. Um, I, I don't understand where we ever are in this world where Biden is somehow 
more divisive than Trump. Even the speeches that Ben is bringing up, I, they, they always bring up. I remember that one. Um, I think we might have even done it on our episode. The, the one speech that Biden gave where at one point that like the background is red. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the Philly speech I referenced. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, oh, my God, it's over. This is the end. And then meanwhile, you've got Donald Trump, you know, coming into office saying things like if you burn the flag, you should have your citizenship revoked. Well, well, I mean, I gotta be honest with you. I think most actual Americans would agree more with that than than you know, um, basically replacing the American flag with the LGBTQ rainbow flag or whatever the hell cotton candy flag and um, the BLM flags and uh, you know foreign flags, right? I, I mean, literally, you're you're allowing millions upon millions of uh people to invade us at our southern border and like i don't know if i want to do something or not and like you're basically holding us hostage in our own nation or talking about ms uh dnc that i'm going to investigate every single one of these uh media organizations for corruptness i'm going to open the libel and defamation laws i'm going to take all of these guys to court um you've got this weird project 2025 stuff where um is it John Paschal, I think, uh, is talking about, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to investigate all of these people and we're going to try to throw crimes at all these people. Uh, Trump is like the most divisive president I think we've ever had in, in at least in, in my lifetime of being um, an, an American citizen. And the rhetoric from him is just it's on a whole other level in terms of the demonization of political opponents. I mean, this is a guy that's known for giving his political opponents bad nicknames, <laughs> right? Like that's what Trump does, um, you know, like. It's funny, but even as a resident of Florida, if Florida had another natural disaster, do you think Trump would withhold aid? Because you had, uh, I think that was one of the few nice things that DeSantis actually said about Biden was that like, hey, listen, you know, when the buildings collapsed in, I think that was in Miami Beach, yeah, that, um, you know, for the hurricane stuff that Biden was there, he was saying, if you guys need aid, however many billions, you can have it. Meanwhile, Trump, I think, was threatening to withhold federal funding from blue states that wouldn't, um, I think it had to do with the National Guard stuff, the deployment of the National Guard, that they weren't like doing enough for the riots and, and... Well, I mean, that's kind of true, right? Like, uh, it's kind of funny how, like, you don't want to defend our people when it comes with the riots, right? But, like, oh, please help the people now with these billions upon billions of dollars, right? So, uh, you know, you should be doing both, right? I mean, yeah, I get it. You, You think he's holding it hostage, but... You know, Biden is going to say whatever he wants to say to Florida because he, he wants them votes, right? Like, he basically, he probably in the back of his mind thinks he's going to win Florida. He's not. Um, it, it, that's all it is. It's rhetoric. It's basically rhetoric. And uh, Trump was threatening to withhold aid from some of these blue states. Um, yeah, Trump is literally the most divisive person in the world. I don't see how on any metric he is ever succeeding in the divisive category. In terms of the economy, I do think it's funny that Republicans are very keen to say that, like, well, we can't really grade Trump, you know, post-COVID because obviously COVID messed everything up, which is fair. But pre-COVID, what did Trump do? Yeah, he did He did deficit spending tax cuts. He presided over historic low interest rates and an economy that was already, like, like blazing past the final years of Obama. We were posting all-time highs on all the stock markets in 2013 onwards. Um, you know, unemployment rates were falling. Now, under Biden, unemployment rates are even lower than they were under Trump. But uh, it, it sucks that for Trump, we can say, well, we can't really hold him accountable for 2020. That was COVID. Well, all we have for Biden is post-COVID. We don't have any pre-COVID Biden, uh, you know, economy. And it was the same thing for Obama, too, coming in right Sounds funny, doesn't it? There's no pre-COVID Biden, right? It's only post-COVID. Seems weird. I'm not saying, but I'm saying, right? And after the housing collapse as well. And it sucks that Republicans are able to walk out of office, you know, having burned the entire American society to the ground economically. And now we've got to try to evaluate, okay, well, what did Obama do during his first two to three to four years just trying to recover from where uh, the housing crash left it? And then we look at Biden now, who's trying to recover from COVID. And now we're grading him on a, on a totally different scale than what Trump is being graded on. Yeah, that that sucks, I think. Uh, we can- I, think uh, I think maybe you should be grading him on the... Uh, you know, uh, dozens of points of inflation that's went up and the fact that like 30, 35 percent more spending has to go into just rent and uh, food costs and electric costs and utilities and you know, it goes on and on and on. The unemployment rates is so low is because uh, there's probably a lot of people not working and it's been I think they stopped counting after 
a certain amount of time. So they're just not counted. It, it, it's not the fact that, that, you know, the unemployment rate itself is lower. It's just the fact that you stop counting people after a certain amount of time. Comment on the foreign policy? On the foreign policy, <clears throat> I'm going to be honest. I am a... Um, I am very liberal. I'm very not progressive. Uh, I'll probably come off as more hawkish than others uh, because I'm not a big fan of this. Which also, if I mean, if Ben agrees, like I think uh, people like people like Trump are going to be the most dovish, isolationist people ever. They don't want to do anything uh, internationally. They just want to, you know, protect America, be at home, protect our economy, don't do anything uh, internationally, which is why he was constantly undermining NATO uh, and constantly, you know, attacking all the, the European Union and, you know, cheering on the UK for brexiting away from the EU. I think that being said, um, I think that Biden has done a phenomenal job uh, when it comes to foreign policy. I th wow, I was not expecting him to say that. What? 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 That is crazy, right? Like, see, here, here's, here's, here's the problem, right? You say Donald Trump was dovish and isolationist. Okay, it is what it is. But the thing is, most of these countries would have never, in their right mind, would have thought to even screw with him, right? Or, 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 or start something that forced his hand because he's crazy, right? They viewed him as nuts. They viewed him as, oh no, he would definitely bomb our entire city and kill every single last one of us if he felt, you know, threatened, you know, or, or his ego was in check, right? So, I mean, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? Because uh, if he was a warmonger, you would say he was a warmonger. That was horrible. You shouldn't, you know, uh, he, sh he shouldn't have been so hawkish. But now that he was a little bit dovish and, and stayed out of wars, now you're, you're using that as a... A, uh, a, a something to beat him over the head with, it, it, you know, it, it does again disingenuous. I think that the coalition building was so important for Ukraine Russia, and I'm so happy that he decided to go to our European allies and our NATO allies and try to build a coalition of people to help Ukraine so that that wasn't only the United States. Um, Personally, especially after doing a whole bunch of research, I do tend to side with Israel over um, Palestine in a lot of the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts. I'm glad that Biden, while remaining a staunch defender of Israel, is trying to rein in some of the more aggressive posturing towards uh, the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. I'm, I'm proud that Biden said, hey, listen, we're going to delay some of these attacks. I am so curious how, what, what Ben's... Uh uh, opinion is on it. Hey, listen, we are going to allow humanitarian aid here. Hey, listen, we are going to try to, uh, you know, not kill as many Palestinian people down there while still, you know, signaling that he would be a staunch supporter of um, of Israel in, in the conflict, assuming the civilian casualties don't go too high. Um, for foreign policy, I mean, blemishes. I mean, the, the, the biggest one you can give to Biden is Afghanistan and the poll out there. But man, are we going to talk about, you know, the uh, inspector general report that says that one of the biggest reasons why the Afghanistan pullout was so disastrous was because of the Doha Accords, where Donald Trump headed talks that didn't even include the Afghanistan army? Uh, I mean, like, these were disasters. Like, when, when Biden took office, we had 2,500 troops left in Afghanistan. Like, what was the options even uh, afforded to Biden at that point? Um, obviously, you've got the abandonment of the Kurds in northern Syria, to, you know, for the Turkish armies to lay waste to. Um, I can talk about Iran and North Korea, although I'm not sure where uh, Ben would land on those. But yeah, that's a broadly. Yeah, well, that's that's a lot from both. They, you you, you, you want to pick pick at something where you disagree with? Well, I, that's one of Destiny's. Uh, you know, his his battle plans is to flood the zone with so much information. Well, you didn't talk about this. Well, you didn't talk about that. Well, you said 77 things out of your damn mouth. You know, I, I can't respond to every single one of them. So, Destiny's good for that. I've watched some of his other debates. He's really good at, at talking so fast and bringing up so many points of, of information or so many points of argument that when you respond to half of them, he, he looks at you and goes, well, see, look, you're avoiding answering, you know, the, the questions about this, this, and this. Well, I didn't get a chance to. It would take me another half an hour of talking just to respond to what the hell you said. Well, I mean, th th there's a lot. So, uh -huh. I mean, so see, there's a lot. Uh, I want to ask a few questions on each one of these. Yeah, sure. Uh, so let's let's talk about divisiveness uh -huh. for a second. So I, there's no one who can make the case that Donald Trump is not divisive. Yeah, of course he's incredibly divisive. It's a given. Uh -huh. Do you treat? Biden's rhetoric with the same level of seriousness that you treat Trump's rhetoric, or sh I should probably put that to the other way around. Should we treat Trump's rhetoric with the same level of seriousness as Joe Biden or, say, Barack Obama's rhetoric? 
Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to be concise when I say these. Broadly speaking, especially in studying Israel, Palestine, and Ukraine, Russia, I try not to take politicians at their word because sometimes they just say stuff to say stuff. I understand that. But broadly speaking, I'm going to look at the rhetoric and the actions, and I am going to grade them the same. So, yes, I would hold Biden and Trump to the same standard. Right. So, m my feeling is, and this is one area where, for clarification, we're going to have a division, mm -hmm. uh, is that I, of course, don't treat Trump's rhetoric in the same way that I treat Biden's or Obama's. He's utterly uncalibrated and he says whatever he wants to at any given time and it doesn't even match up with his policy very often. Can uh, I ask you, like, for our head of state, our chief executive, shouldn't rhetoric be arguably one of the most important things that he does? I mean, like, the answer would be yes. And now I've been given a choice between a person who I think in calibrated ways says things that are divisive and a person who in uncalibrated ways says things that are divisive. And so the evidence that Joe Biden is divisive is every poll taken since essentially August of, of 2021. He he is, by all available metrics, incredibly divisive. A huge percentage of Americans are deeply unhappy, not only with his performance, but don't believe he's a uniter. They're, they're, that, that's just the reality. And that may just be a reflection. I mean, honestly, we may be putting too much on Trump or Biden personally. It may just uh -huh. be that the American people themselves are rhetorically divided because of social media, and social media can, in fact, be accessible. And, I would, and all one of that. thing that I would ask you about that, though, sure. is I agree, especially when you look at the favorability. But sometimes w when I look at these polls, when you start to disaggregate them by party, I wonder if it's actually is Biden historically divisive or um, I'm trying to think. Yes, yes, yes. Because he literally, it, 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 it's just not just him. His whole entire administration, it's about identity. It's about identity. And the identity isn't of like, hey, you, you know, you're a United States citizen. You, you're an American, right? That That's not the identity. The identity is whatever your sexual preference is or your gender, a.k.a. sex or... Uh, you know, whatever nonsense, nonsensical uh, opinion you have of yourself, regardless of your nationality, right? Like your nationalism it should be American, right? Like you, you, everything you say and do as an American citizen should be in the benefit of the United States because it protects you, right? I got to be honest with you. One of my conspiracy theories is they're building basically a secret army with LGBTQ, right? Which crosses the borders. You think about it. If you tried to say, oh, you know, tried to, to, to gain Americanism across seas, they would say, oh, you're using your country to try to invade mine. This is war. But if you use sexuality, a.k.a. LGBTQ, you can just say, oh, well, that's everywhere, you know, and you're basically becoming the head of that army secretly all around the world. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. That's my theory, right? Like, that's one of my conspiracy theories. I have a feeling that it's probably going to come out true one day. But that's my theory. I think of a really polite way to say this. The people that like Trump worship Trump. I don't know. I Like, one of the most prescient things that Trump could have probably ever said was that I could kill someone on Fifth Street and nobody would so, hold me accountable. So is it really that Biden is strictly divisive or is it that every single Trump supporter will always say that Trump is great and no, always I, say that Biden is No, the, the reason I would say that, that Biden is, in fact, historically divisive mm -hmm. is because Republicans felt much more strongly about Barack Obama than, than Joe Biden, actually. But they didn't um, feel as strongly about Trump as they did about, like, Romney or McCain. Right. In in what way? I mean, and like, the, the allegiance to Trump. Oh no, th there's certainly more allegiance to Trump than there is to Romney or McCain, largely because Trump won in 2016. But beyond that, the the point that I'm making is that if you're looking at the stats in terms of divisiveness, mm -hmm. Republicans always find the Democratic president divisive. The question is where the rest of the country is. Mm -hmm. And right now, there are a lot of Democrats who either don't agree with Biden or you know find him divisive. There are a lot of independents who find him divisive. So. When, you're, when we're comparing these things, I don't think they're leagues apart in terms of the divisive effects of what they say. Do right, and, and, and I'm separating that off from like the inherent content of what they say, because obviously what Trump says is, is more divisive just on like the raw level. I mean, if he's insulting people as opposed to Joe Biden doing MAGA Republicans, like if I were to just, if I were an alien come down from space and look at these two statements, I'd say this one's more divisive than this one. Mm -hmm. But then there's the reality of being a human being in the world, and that is everyone has baked Donald Trump into the cake. And Joe Biden, again, started off with a patina of being non-divisive and now has emerged as divisive, I, if you don't mind. Yeah, because it's kind of grandfathered in, right? Like the, the, the quote-unquote divisiveness of Donald Trump is kind of baked in at this point, right? I mean, it's kind of, you know, it is what it is. We know how he is, so we don't even see it as divisiveness. We just see it as regular run of the mill. Again, he didn't lie. He didn't bullshit you. I mean, he came out and was like, you're sending your worst, you know. Mexico's sending their worst. Some of them are good people, but you're sending your worst, right? 
So, I, I mean, at least he... At least he was up front with everybody. I actually want to get to the, the foreign policy questions because this one is actually slightly less interesting to me. Sure. Yeah, well, can I, yeah, answer, just, sure, yeah, just one quick thing, I guess. Like, Because we can say the reality of it and we can look at opinion polls. What if we look at like legislative accomplishments? Like Biden is working on a 50-50 divided Senate. Donald Trump had both House of Congress. Yeah, but divisiveness is a feeling, right? Divisiveness is... Uh, is, is it, you can't really put your finger on that you can put your, your your finger on legislation and legislative accomplishments but you can't put your finger on divisiveness on that's it's a feeling on how people feel do 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 i feel the division between this person compared to this person right so now you're moving the goalpost right you're, you're again you're you're creating another red herring straw man to basically say look over here and you're and now you're 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 making another mark that Ben Shapiro's has got to you know got to justify somehow. Congress and the Supreme Court and got like no major legislation passed. Well, but. I mean, he 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 did lose Congress in 2018, but yeah, sure. But, but prior to that, because pri we got the uh, we got the infrastructure bill. I think in one year, which Trump promised for his entire presidency, didn't get anywhere. Well, on it. It, I mean, yes, his his Republican base was not in favor of mass spending on infrastructure, and neither am I. So th there's that. I think that's sure. mostly a state and local. But they issue. were in favor of mass spending for tax cuts. That's not a spending. I mean, we. It, I mean, effectively, it, it is right. Like effectively, it's not. Well, if, if you're, if you're if cutting you, tax receipts, but you're not changing the level of spending, like Biden did with the uh, IRA. I mean, uh, again, well, we, we, have, we have a fundamental philosophical difference here. I think that when, you, when the government takes my money, mm -hmm. that, is not, that is not the government somehow being more fiscally responsible. And when the government allows me to keep my money, I don't see that as the government spending. I see that as my money and the government is taking less of it. That's great. But at the end of the day, the government is still going to be in a deficit spending and they're going to have to borrow money from the treasury. Right. We have a spending problem. In yeah. other words, not a receipts problem is the sure. case that I'm making. The, sure. the problem with, with Donald Trump is... Yeah, the government spends too much. It's not, you know, that they're taking too little. They just spend too much. If they, it, so basically, if, if the government, you have, see, I don't know why Ben, you didn't do it. Should I ask Destiny? Well, what if the government cut their spending in half? What if they said, uh, we're going to eliminate this, this, and this for spending? Um, but they collected the same amount of taxes. Would he consider that less spending, more spending, or the same? Because by his, by his own metric, he's saying that, that, they have to spend more because they're collecting less taxes from you. Well, what if they collected the same and spent it n less? Would that actually be less spending? Or would that be the same amount? So your mathematics is wrong. It just, it just doesn't make any sense. It's not that he lowered taxes. The United States has one of the most progressive tax systems on the planet. And in fact, if you wish to have a European-style social welfare state, what you actually need is to tax the middle class to death. I mean, the, the reality is that the top 20% of the American population pays literally all net taxes in the United States mm -hmm. after, after state benefits and all of this. Sure. So if, if you actually wanted to have the kind of social welfare state that many liberals seem to want to have, like Northern Europe, for example, mm -hmm. you'd actually have to tax people who make forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars sure. $60,000. And I don't want that. Rate. I agree with that. So but how do you explain the lack of legislation? I mean, if he's like such a uniter. Because I think the Republican Party itself is, is quite divided. And I think that Trump's... But isn't that his job? He's the head of the Republican Party. He's the president, Republican president of the United States. I mean, again, I don't think that Joe Biden has passed wildly historic legislation. The other than... Bill was the largest... Like, So here, here's yeah. the problem. If you're a Republican, uh -huh. the only bills that you can get consensus on tend to be bills that either... that that. Let's be real about this. That are tax cuts mm -hmm. because, as you would, I think, agree with, mm -hmm. when it comes to polling data, Americans constantly say they want to cut the government. And then the minute you ask them which program, they have they no idea what they're, they're Right, exactly. And so trying to, add, it's much harder to come up with a bill to cut things than it is to come up with a bill to add things. Coming up, which is why. That was part two of the Destiny Ben Shapiro debate. Um, got in a little bit of like uh, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. Uh, a little bit of legislation, a little bit in the minutia. Um, if you enjoyed this, hit like, subscribe, uh, ring the notification bell. I'm Simple Son. And uh, watch out for part three. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.